There's a weird, not so well known fact about Finding Nemo that makes it, well, downright creepy. Imagine this, you're a young clownfish, chilling in your cosy little nemony, living your best life. Things are going great, until BAM, your mum dies. That's a major bummer, so naturally, you do what any clownfish would do. You cry it out in bed, feeling completely miserable. Just when you think your life can't get any worse, your dad comes to console you. But no, dad starts growing a massive pair of fishy boobs like it's no big deal. Instead of giving you a heartfelt hug, he turns into a freaking woman right before your eyes. You can't make this stuff up. This is your dad suddenly morphing into your new mum. Now you're probably thinking, this is the weirdest horror story I've ever heard. But surprise, it's actually just how clownfish roll. Clownfish live in little groups inhabiting a single anemone, like a weird family with one super important rule. The dominant female and her main squeeze the male run the show. But once the female dies, bam, that male, in this case Marlin, Nemo's dad, transforms into the female, like some sort of fishy makeover show. It's called sequential hermaphroditism. All clownfish start life as males. They're called protandrous hermaphrodites meaning they begin their life as boys and choose to turn into women when necessary. About 2% of fish species, roughly 500 different species worldwide do this. So it's not totally out there, but still, it's like an aquatic version of the bachelor, but with a lot more fish boobs. The DNA of the fish itself doesn't actually change, but the expression of different genes which already exist does change. This whole process is not very well understood. We do know that a whole set of different hormones is in charge of the expression of either male or female organs, which promptly can change the sex of a clownfish from male to female. For the transitioning male, the testes dissolve and ovaries form. But wait, as always, it gets worse. Nemo's dad, Marlin, should have stepped into the role as the new dominant female. As the new dominant female, let's call him Melinda, Melinda now needs another mate. Because we are in creepy clownfish land, the next dominant male would have to step up to the plate and take over as the new male breeding partner. But that means, yeah. Oh God, please no. Yeah. It can't be! Yeah. So now, dear viewer, have you worked it out yet? So who's next in line? That's right, Nemo. This means little Nemo, the next largest, or in this case, the only other clownfish who's just a baby, would have to become his dad's new mate. Can you imagine the awkwardness? Dad, nice boobs. That's one scene that definitely got cut from Finding Nemo. Normally, the breeding male clownfish keeps the younger, non-breeding fish in check by preventing them from growing too big and trying to steal his position. He does this by snatching the best bits of food. Scientists aren't 100% certain why sequential hermaphroditism has evolved, but it is thought that the living arrangements of clownfish have played a role. These fish have evolved to stick close to their crib, which is a sea anemone they formed a symbiotic relationship with. They need to stick to this area as there are too many predators on the exposed reef, which makes clownfish leaving a problem. In order to get a chance to breed, they may have evolved as sequential hermaphrodites. When you cannot afford to wander off to find a mate, you just partner up with whoever lives there. And if there are no females, you simply turn into one. So let's see how realistic the rest of the film is. Well, clownfish live in anemones on the Great Barrier Reef. This part is totally true. The fish and the anemones have a mutually beneficial symbiotic relationship. The anemones protect the clownfish from predators and provide scraps of food. And the clownfish lure in unsuspecting fish to become lunch for their poisonous anemone pals. Oh, and their poop fertilizes the anemones. A little extra Finding Nemo tidbit. 
More pooping, less Pixar magic. The clownfish performs an elaborate dance with an anemone before taking up residence, gently touching its tentacles with different parts of their bodies until they are acclimatized to their host. A layer of mucus on the clownfish's skin makes it immune to the fish-eating anemone's lethal sting. Moving on to some of the other characters in Finding Nemo. Let's dive into Bruce and that whole blood frenzy situation. First off, it's a myth that sharks can smell a single drop of blood from a mile away. If sharks really had that superpower, imagine the chaos of all the smells in the ocean. It would be sensory overload. In reality, sharks' noses aren't quite that magical. They can detect smells at between one part per 25 billion and one part per 10 billion depending on the species, which is actually the same sensitivity as most other fish. So it's more like smelling one drop of blood in a small swimming pool. So yes, they probably would catch that one drop of blood in Finding Nemo. And it is true that sharks use their sense of smell to help hunt prey, but you're not going to see them charging from the other side of the ocean to find it. Sharks are more likely to be attracted to general disturbances in the water as these identify potentially injured prey items. They can, however, get triggered into a feeding frenzy. A feeding frenzy of sharks occurs when a small group of sharks fight over prey, biting anything that moves. This can include other sharks or anything else within biting range. And fun fact, sharks will continue eating even after they've been disemboweled by their fellow sharks. Now, let's talk about the EAC did The East Australian Current, where Marlin and Dory team up with sea turtles to head down to Sydney. The EAC is about 100 kilometers wide and runs more than 500 meters into the deep, dark abyss of the ocean. The EAC spans the length of the east coast of Australia, measuring around 4,000 kilometers, transporting an insane 30 million cubic meters of water water per second. This current is like the unsung superhero of the Great Barrier Reef, redistributing nutrients and warmth like it's on a mission to help the Great Barrier Reef get its glow up. But here's where Finding Nemo gets a bit loose with the truth. While the EAC does indeed act like a super highway for fish and turtles, it's not exactly the rocket speed highway we see in the movie. This current isn't racing at 90 miles per hour. The peak speed is around seven kilometers per hour. Let's just say not quite fishy Formula One. It's more like a lazy river ride kind of speed. Even with the more chill flow, thousands of fish are swept from the Great Barrier Reef down to Sydney every summer. Don't worry. The Great Barrier Reef is thriving thanks to the warm tropical water it gets from the current. So the EAC really is a fishy superhighway with hundreds of different species being swept along in its current. It's just not quite as extreme as it makes out in the film. So where do we stand on Finding Nemo? Lots of the fishy science really is quite accurate. There is one enormous glaring hole in the storyline, but let's face it, fishy sex changes probably isn't the family friendly viewing Pixar was going for. So Finding Nemo gets a definite scientific pass. <laughs>